Today I'm going to be presenting, uh, I think, basically the framework uh, for understanding uh, where this talk of representation comes from, insofar as it's relevant to uh, cognitive science today. Um, and I think uh, Eric will take it in a more anthropological di direction, but it's basically the, the same ideas. There, there's, a, uh, there's this concept of representation that's been used in, uh, in cognitive science, it's actually very central. And it's been uh, extended and applied in anthropology, and uh, the, the debates that we're having center around this. So um, today, what I'm going to try to do first is just clarify those first questions uh, that Sam was asking a little earlier. So what is a representation? What do we mean by representationalism? I'm going to try to just make it a little less abstract by fleshing it out in the two main uh, research paradigms in cognitive science today, so classical cognitivism and connectionism. Um, then I'm going to move to the, the meaty issue, which is anti-representationalism, because as, uh, as Sam said in the introduction, it's become very fashionable to uh, believe that there is no such thing as uh, representation, is that we've, uh, this is a, uh, a kind of byproduct of our Cartesian way of thinking of the mind. And uh, I'm going to try to respond uh, to the anti-representationalist challenge. And if we have time, I'll close with anti-anti-representationalism. Um, so, what is the alternative if we're if we're going to uh, if we're going to criticize the anti-representationalist stance? What's left? What kind of can we reintroduce uh, representations into our framework? So, first things first, we're going to move to representations, yeah, representations and representationalism. So, what is representationalism? Um, I would argue that it's a claim, uh, it's an epistemological claim, first and foremost. It's a claim about the kind of explanatory models that we're using in cognitive science. So to be more specific, the claim is that cognitive science ought to employ representations in its scientific account of intelligent, purposive behavior. So this leads us to the representational theory of mind, which is arguably the mainstream view uh, in cognitive science. It's to view the mind as basically made up of these representations, and to view the activity of the mind as essentially operations defined over those representations. So now we have a vague gesturing idea of what representational, representationalism is, but we still haven't clarified what a representation is per se. So what is a representation? So this is a very schematic um, diagram, I guess, of, uh, of a cognitive system, and it's supposed to illustrate what we're trying to explain in cognitive science. So we have this cognitive system, uh, the cognitive system is exposed to a situation, and it seems to produce intelligent, flexible behavior. And this is what we want to explain. We want to explain how it is that the cognitive system is able to respond appropriately to its environment. So uh, the, the strategy... So the strategy of the cognitive science is to say, okay, so the cognitive system is endowed with internal representations, and these representations allow it to inform its, its actions. It, it's these representations that allow for uh, an explanation of flexible, intelligent behavior. So this is basically the idea, is that we have these, these uh, I guess you could say, these entities within us, and they're causally responsible for the intelligent and flexible character of our behavior. So just briefly, there are two kinds of representations in the literature. There are online representations, which are going to be the focus of today's paper, because the, well, today's talk, because they're, they're also the focus of, uh, of most of the critiques of uh, representationalism. This is online representation. It's representation um, that's involved in actively coping with the situation. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's <laughs> super necessary. Do you guys want the, the lights oh, on or off? Um, yeah. yeah, let's keep it on. All right. So what I'm not going to be talking about today, although it might be interesting, is offline representations. So this is the kind of representation that would be involved when I, uh, for, for instance, I think about Paris or I think about... Uh, a long lost friend, or uh, I think about a situation in which I'm not actively engaged in. There's a literature on that, but we're really going to focus on the more online variety that, that, that engages the system in a given situation. 
Um, okay, so now we have a basic idea of what a representation, a re representation is. I'm going to introduce two criteria that are going to allow us to pinpoint what, it, it individuate in a way, what, what representations are, right? So these are the responsibility criteria and the identification criteria, which relate to uh, the notions of instructionism and the neural assumption in uh, the readings that we had for today. So first, the responsibility criteria. This uh, was, it's not exactly Kirchhoff's phrasing, but um, this is pretty much how he presents it in his 2011 article. The idea, again, is that uh, for an internal state or process of a cognitive system that, that's interesting to us, uh, to count as a representation, that, that state or process must be causally responsible for the adaptivity, uh, the adaptiveness and flexibility of uh, the system's behavior, right? So this has to do with the explanatory relevance of using the representations at all. If we look at, at here uh, in the diagram, or rather here with the online situation, why representations are relevant at all is that they actually inform behavior. If, if, they, if they didn't, you wouldn't have any use for them in, in science. Um, so this is the first, uh, the first criterion which relates to explanatory relevance. In the text, the, in the text that we're uh, assigned for today, this is the idea of instructionism, right? So it, it's that representations act essentially as a kind of set of instructions for intelligent purposive behavior. So they, they inform the, uh, the, the motor behavior, the, yeah, all of the behavior type, behavioral types that we see um, exhibited by uh, cognitive systems. So it's, it's akin to something like a program or a recipe is the basic idea. Um, yeah, so again, just to close on this uh, idea, uh, representations are responsible for uh, intelligent behavior insofar as they provide instructions for intelligent behavior. Um, the second criteria that will allow us to identify uh, representations is the identification criterion, right? So if we're assuming that there are these, uh, these entities that inform uh, behavior that, that are causally responsible for the adaptiveness and the flexibility of the behavior that we observe, we have to be able to identify them. Otherwise, it's just, uh, it's just fluff. We're just supposing that there are these things, but we're not able to identify them. So again, uh, the identification criterion is this idea that for a mental state or process to count as a representation, um, then it must be scientifically identifiable. So it, it has to be composed of, so the system has to be composed of subsystems and we have to be able to identify one of those sub subsystems and uh, the tasks that it accomplishes and be able to say this is a representation. So the main assumption in the literature is that we're going to be dealing with um, neural states. So uh, this is going to be, this is going to come under discussion a little bit uh, later. Do all representations necessarily have to be neural in some form? We'll, we'll address the question, but f in most of the literature there's, just, there's this assumption that um, if there are representations, they're going to be somewhere in the brain. Um, so that's pretty much it for uh, representations and representationalism. Is everything clear so far? Yeah? All right. So. Um, so that, that's very abstract, but how does that cash into uh, cognitive science research? So it caches out in cognitive science research because most of the main research paradigms in, uh, in cognitive science are representational in nature. Right? So um, there, for the longest time there were two, uh, I guess you could say, schools of thought about representation. And uh, so the, the, compu the traditional uh, cognitivist computational theory of mind and, uh, and connectionism. And both of these uh, forms of cognitive science defend some kind of uh, representational theory of mind. So uh, the Macy conferences uh, were basically the, uh, the inception of the cognitive science movement, especially the cybernetics conferences from uh, 46 to 53. Um, and from these conferences, um, the, the first form of cognitive science um, emerged and uh, there was a there was a metaphor behind the, the first the first wave of cognitive science the metaphor of the mind as a kind of digital computer right so what is the mind in this framework the mind is defined as a set of computations defined over representations so what what, what defines this first uh, what, what characterizes this first wave of thinking about representations is that representations are discrete and symbol like very much like uh, you'd find in a computer, right? So 
these, these representations would be easy to uh, distinguish from one another and they would be discrete, importantly. So to get an idea of how that works, um, Fodor, who is uh, Jerry Fodor right here, who is basically the instigator of philosophy of cognitive science, um, in, his, uh, in, his, in his seminal work, uh, The Language of Thought, uh, proposes a language of thought hypothesis, which is essentially to understand the economy of representations in the mind as a kind of language, which he calls mental ease. Right? So the idea here is that um, when, you, when you're in an interaction with, uh, with a certain kind of object, well, the, your interaction with that, with that object will cause an, an instance of the representation in your mental economy. So it's a little... Uh, it, it, it's a little simplistic, but for, for our purposes it'll do. You, you have something kind of like a belief box. And any, any representation in your belief box in your mind is something that you believe in, right? So suppose you're faced with a cat, a cat on the mat, right? And, well, when you're faced with a cat on the mat, you have something like cat on mat that appears in your belief box, right? So Fodor and company and the first wave of cognitive scientists really thought that cat, mat, on were discrete representations, were discrete entities. Um, yeah, so um, there's a little more to the Fodorian story. Fodor is also responsible for uh, the idea of uh, modularity. So to make a long story short, the idea of Fodor is that the mind processes information not in a kind of holistic way, but in a very encapsulated way. So you would have these specific modules which are um, identified through their function. So for instance, we're able to see. All, most of us, I, I presume, are able to see. So in, in, in Fodor talk, we would have a visual module or a module for vis visual representation. And modules are defined um, principally in terms of their domain specificity. So you would have one type of module for one kind of input. And uh, what, what characterizes the modular view is that they, there's a limited access to other modules and that the information contained in every module is encapsulated. So basically every, every module is running, it's doing its little thing, and it runs with its own representations, and then it outputs everything into a kind of central processor, which I'll get to in a moment. If we want to get back to the two criteria, we can see this is basically how I would uh, split it up. So the first, few, uh, the first few criteria of modularity refer to uh, the explanatory relevance of using, uh, of using modules, right? So they're fast, they're informationally enca encapsulated, they account for a certain uh, domain of, uh, of input, so for a certain kind of proficiency or skill. And uh, we can individuate them because they're related to a fixed neuronal architecture. They, they break down in specific ways that can be studied by cognitive science, for instance, by lesion studies. And I guess you could also identify them uh, in a way with, uh, with their domain specificity, so the kind of inputs, again, that they're, uh, that they're treating. Um, so I think I'll... Uh, well, th there's a story that can be told about how Fodor believed that most cognition is actually central cognition. It would be holistic. And he, Fodor was... Uh, was known to be very skeptical about the, the very idea that cognitive science could explain these things. For Fodor, if something wasn't modular, it couldn't be explained by cognitive science. But evolutionary psychology, as I'm sure some of you know, uh, take issue with this idea and basically say that it's modules all the way down. That if, if natural selection is supposed to be able to be... Uh, if natural selection is to select anything, then, then the, those objects that it selects has to have to be uh, encapsulated in some way. They have to be discrete. So, I mean, the moral of the story for for the first wave of cognitive scientists is everything is kind of modular. Everything is kind of discrete. Representations are discrete. Modules are discrete. Also, there's very little interconnection in everything. Um, so that's basically what's going on for the first wave. Um, but then something happened in the 80s, and it was remarked that this is this is not very biologically plausible. I mean, there's nothing in in the brain, at least, that, that seems very discrete. There's, there's nothing symbol-like about the brain. What, what's in the brain is networks of cells, networks of neurons, mostly. So there was a second wave in cognitive science um, that emphasized the biological plausibility of these representations. So if there's still going to be representation talk, we should be providing models that are at least consonant with the findings of biology. And so connectionism was born. 
Um, and the basic idea behind connectionism is that instead of having uh, discrete symbol-like representations that are kind of tokened in these, these functional boxes in the mind, uh, what you have is a network of neurons that are connected to each other and acti ac activity that propagates throughout the network. Um, so in any given unit in a connectionist network, the activation is kind of summed up and if it goes over a certain threshold, then the activity propagates through the rest of the network. And it turns out that there are some interesting information processing uh, properties. Like you, you can essentially construct uh, neural networks that, that do algorithms, that, uh, that, that can do calculations. Um, like a, a lot of the, uh, a lot of, a lot of the uh, computational technology that we use today relies on uh, this kind of architecture. And so in these, uh, in these networks, um, representations are encoded not discreetly, but in a distributed form. So what happens is that it's not so much that this unit, say, encodes for uh, a trait or a uh, whatever you would like to encode uh, for visual perception for an object or whatever. It's that it's the sum of these connections. It's the weights between the, uh, the units that, that account for the distributed nature um, of a representation. So rather than having one discrete token, you, you, you would have this network structure where whatever you're, you want to encode is encoded dynamically um, and in a distributed manner throughout the network. Um, I was going to do a little bit about um, phase spaces and how this works in more detail, but I think we can get to it uh, maybe in the discussion if it's interesting. Um, I just want to get to the meat of the presentation, right? So uh, anti-representationalism and its critics. So I'm going to examine uh, two objections to the representation story I just told. Um, one from non-trivial causal spread, which I'll get to in a second, and another from continuous reciprocal causation, and we'll see that they undermine each of the criteria that we set out at the beginning. So the first objection is that from non-trivial causal spread. Um, I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with the extended, embodied, inactive, uh, the 4EA approach and so forth. So the idea here is that um, there are elements of the cognitive system that are external to the cognitive system, but that seem to account for the intelligent and flexible character of behavior. So for instance, um, if, I, if I take chalk and I start doing uh, I don't know, some very complex calculations on uh, the blackboard or the green board, um, well, it, there's a sense in which I actually need the support of the, of the material in order to continue uh, engaging in this intelligent behavior. And for, for very simple things, I could possibly do it for this particular calculation, I suppose I wouldn't need a blackboard to do it. But if you if you start doing like if you start deriving, if you start doing complex mathematical things, well, there's a sense in which the paper and the material support is not only um, a uh, like an addition, but it's actually constitutive of my thinking process. If for some reason, after uh, I don't know 50 lines of, of writing, that the, I, I was removed from the blackboard. There's a sense, in, a sense in which I wouldn't be able to continue producing intelligent behavior. So that undermines our capacity to attribute um, the causal contribution uh, of, uh, of representations as accounting for intelligent and flexible behavior to those representations, because there seem to be elements outside of these representational networks that contribute to intelligent behavior. And the same can be said uh, for embodied cognition. So in the text that everyone uh, was assigned for today, we saw that uh, in the case of cricket phonotaxis, how crickets actually navigate towards their mates is not really uh, all that dependent on only the, the neural firing, but also on the cricket's bodily disposition. So the fact that the ears are asymmetrically, play, asymmetrically close to uh, the sound source will have some, some incidence on how the cricket is actually able to, to pick out the spatial location of where its, it, its mate is and eventually move there. So the idea behind uh, non-trivial causal spread is that this is, this is what we would like it to look like in a simple representationalist picture, but in, in cases of non-trivial causal spread, we have elements of the environment that contribute to the generation of intelligent behavior, and we also have bodily elements that come and contribute in a non-negligible, non-trivial way to the generation of intelligent behavior. So what do we do? Well, this is a kind of problem. 
because we, we can't attribute responsibility anymore to the representation. So the proposal by Clark and uh, Wheeler uh, is to, to, to go with an analogy in genetics. So I'm sure some of you are, are familiar uh, with the idea of epigenetics, right? So it's, it's true to say, in a sense, that uh, genes code for certain proteins, but it's not like the genes just do their thing outside of any influence and don't depend on anything else. There's a host of epigenetic factors uh, that allow for gene expression. So I'm not going to go too much into this because I, I, I take it as a uh, uh, principle of uh, presentations that it's, it, it won't illuminate uh, something that's difficult to understand by doing something that's even more difficult to understand, right? So let's not go into epigenetics. But the idea here is that um, the fact that there are epigenetic factors that allow for gene expression does not mean that genes don't encode in some sense uh, for protein. So in an analogous way, we can say that just because there are causal factors outside of representations that can help account for the intelligence and flexibility of behavior doesn't mean that representations are not doing something very specific. So the, uh, the Wheeler proposal, which is very similar to what he did with Clark, but uh, Wheeler's criteria are, I think, more streamlined, so I'm going to go with them, is to say, well, genes, we can understand gene, uh, the, uh, what representations are doing in, uh, analogously with what genes are doing by considering two, uh, two features of representations, what he's calling genic representation. So arbitrarity and homuncularity, I'm going to get to them right away. And th the idea here again is that we're going to counter the, non the non-trivial causal spread objection by appealing to the functional world of, rep of representations and specifically to the notion of information. Um, so this is basically just a mock-up again, mock again of the, the situation. So you have a physical stimulus, you have light bombarding the retina, you have uh, acoustic signals bouncing around and the organism is able to pick this up. Uh, but the point uh, here is that the, the, what's relevant for the system is not so much the physical stimulus itself, it's the information contained by the physical stimulus. So it's not the first order physical properties that the, that the nervous system is picking up, it's the second order uh, informational properties that the system is picking up, right? So the, uh, <coughs> what, what's going on in the representation is in a sense medium independent. So of course you need a medium. You need neurons or whatever to be computing, but it's not the physical properties of the neurons that matter so much as, uh, as their, their functional or informational properties. It's what Wheeler was calling an equivalence class. So this, this might seem a, a little bit austere and jargon to use, but suppose, um, just to make it uh, more pal pal palatable, um, suppose I had some kind of horrific accident and became blind, and then thanks to the the miracle of, uh, of modern medicine, someone implanted a chip in my head that replaced whatever brain part was damaged. Well, the reason a chip can play the same role as a brain structure is because the, the chip and the brain structure are sensitive to the same kinds of information and will react in, in, a, in a similar patterned way to that information. So again, it's not the, it's not the first order physical properties that, that matter, it's, uh, it's the, the informational properties of the system that matter. Um, so that's, that's why he says arbitrarity as a criterion, right? So the, the physical properties are more or less arbitrary. What counts is their functional role, what, they, what the kind of information that they allow you to process. Is that, is that clear for everyone? All right. Um, so that's for, uh, for arbitrarity. The second point is homuncularity. So uh, this is the idea that uh, for representations to be useful to cognitive science and to not succumb to the, uh, the obje objection from uh, non-trivial um, causal spread, the system needs to be organized hierarchically. So uh, you would have different levels of organization in the system and the crucial thing is that uh, farther down in the processing stream, some, some components of the system are able to pick up the information uh, higher up in the stream and actually do something productive with it. So this is very analogous to um, how, uh, how we can preserve a uh, representational status for genes. And uh, the hope uh, for Wheeler and Clark is that this same kind of strategy will be able to uh, save uh, representations from, uh, from the critique uh, from, from an activist and, uh, and embodied and extended mind theorist and so forth. So, so much for the first objection. Uh, does anyone have any remarks? 
So the second objection is a little more serious because it undermines not only our capacity to attribute causal responsibility to our representations, um, but it's, it undermines our capacity to identify representations at all. Right? So um, Timothy Van Gelder in 95 and then in 98 um, proposed a dynamical conception of brain. And of course the, there were predecessors, but He's the one who really drove it home, at least in the philosophical literature. So Van Gelder was kind of arguing, okay, so the computer metaphor, maybe not so much. Maybe it's not working. We need another metaphor for the mind, and the metaphor that he proposed was the Watt governor. Um, so I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with uh, the Watt governor. Um, the Watt governor uh, was designed by James Watt, who, uh, who was an engineer, and his problem was, uh, what he was trying to address was um, in, um, in, in industry, when you're using steam machines, you have to find a way to regulate the steam pressure, right? Because you have people who are actually using these machines in, in, the, in the factory, right? And if suddenly the steam pressure starts going really high and becomes out of control, then people might actually become injured. So you had, he had to find a way to, uh, to dynamically correct um, the steam pressure, and what he found uh, as a solution was actually very interesting. So the, the watt governor itself is this little thing with two little wheels. So the way it's connected, as steam builds up in the pipes, as pressure builds up, these little wheels, which are connected to the little spinny thing here, well, as, as pressure builds up, the wheels are going to turn faster and faster. And because of the way the machine is built, as, as the wheels turn faster, they also open up. And as they open up, they can let steam Put, they, they, they let steam out of the system, and that's how the system regulates itself. Once this, if the steam gets too high, the wheels start turning faster, they raise, and by doing so, they raise this little clappet, which it's attached to. The clappet lets steam release, and the system dynamically regulates its level that way. So Van Gelder is arguing that this is actually a better metaphor uh, than a computer for what the brain is doing. The brain is not so much um, operating on any kind of representation as it is just dynamically coping with, with the environment in a, in a smooth way, if you will. So uh, dynamical systems view as opposed to uh, a computationalist view. Um, now this, this undermines our capacity to identify uh, representations by extension because this is an integrated system. Um, you couldn't say that any specific part of the system is doing is responsible for one specific thing. It's really working as a as a, an integrated uh, system, such that yeah, it, it it becomes. I mean, you you could you could isolate any of the parts and say, okay, well, you know, th this is a little ball and so forth. But when you're actually looking at the dynamics, it becomes uh, very uninformative to treat this as uh, as a collection of different uh, a collection of different subsystems. So this has been uh, applied in, uh, in cognitive science. This is from uh, Evan Thompson and Ezekiel DiPaolo. This is the idea of operational closer. So this is kind of like how the inactivists view uh, mind function and body function. What you have is not um, discreetly identifiable uh, modules that are responsible for one function. What you have is like, this big dynamic network where everything is kind of causing everything else, so it becomes very, it, for them at least, it's almost, uh, it, it's, it's very non-informative to try to isolate any part of the system and say, okay, well this, this is a representation, this is responsible for this kind of information processing. And I mean, you know, it's, it's a plausible view. Uh, neuroscience is kind of headed in uh, this direction, so to the left uh, we have a simulated thalamocortical brain network uh, from the Allen Mouse Brain Con Connectivity Atlas. And uh, here we have a uh, diffusion spectrum image of the human brain from uh, nature, and you'll notice that everything is connected to everything else, right? So there seems to be a uh, weight to this idea that maybe everything is just too interconnected, and maybe it's just impossible to isolate even a distributed representation and to say, well, this is a representation. Um, so how do we address this problem? Um, there is a, a line of thinking in uh, cognitive science that's emerged since, I guess, the beginning of uh, the 2000s, um, which is mechanistic analysis and decomposition, right? So the, the main concept operative here is that of a mechanism. So a mechanism is a structure that performs fun functions, right? 
in virtue of its parts and operations, which are coupled together. So essentially, a, uh, a mechanism is parts coupled to functions. Uh, sorry, coupled to operations, which then uh, allow us to uh, explain what, whatever phenomena we're trying to explain. So we can, we can take a given system and decompose it and say, okay, well, we have these parts, we have these operations, and they're organized in a certain way, and we can reiterate this decomposition until we, we reach some kind of ground level. Right? I mean, just to, to make this uh, a little more intuitive, say we have the eye, and we want to explain what the eye is doing. Well, then we can look at the structure of the eye and say, oh, well, look, there's this very interesting structure filled with neurons uh, called the retina. And then we can look at the retina and say, oh, well, the, this retina itself is composed of other sub-mechanisms, which in turn are composed of other sub-mechanisms, and we can get down to this basic biological level where what's going on is like molecules and interactions of molecules. And um, the reason why uh, the mechanistic uh, analysis kind of gives us a response to this um, actually goes back to, uh, to Simon, who's one of the great, um, the great cognitive scientists, and he, he proposes an analogy. Um, he says, suppose we have uh, two watchmakers, Tempest and Hora. So what Tempest does is, um, Tempest is a fan of, uh, of hierarchical organization and systems, and what Tempest is, does is uh, he builds little, little sets of 10 pieces, and then takes 10 of those, and so forth, and builds his watches. So he assembles his, his thousand piece watch in little sub-assemblies. Whereas Hora, eschews this, uh, this, this hierarchical organization and uh, just tries to build them just one piece at a time and lining up a thousand, a thousand pieces and build, building every watch that way. So um, Simon ran a few calculations and figured out that um, uh, Tempest, the one using hierarchical uh, assemblies, sub-assemblies, would be 4,000 times more efficient at building watches uh, than Hora. Uh, assuming that in 1% of the cases, um, something would happen to distract them and they would have to let go of the assembly, like a, an order that they would have to deal with. So what this is getting at is this idea that maybe um, it's, it's possible that systems in nature might exhibit hierarchical organization. In fact, uh, this gives us good reason to think that uh, biological systems in nature will be hierarchical in some sense. Uh, because it's just more efficient, and, uh, and uh, natural selection tends to uh, be a cheapskate and select the most efficient solution. Um, so it's just far more likely that the biological systems that we encounter um, in, uh, in, in our scientific activities will also have some kind of hierarchical organization. So the proposal by Bechtel and company is to say, okay, you have decomposable systems which pose no problem uh, to, to representational analysis, we can neatly cut them up into little parts. There's not much interaction between the subparts. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are completely non-decomposable systems like the Watt governor where everything is working together and there's no real way to isolate anything in particular. And Simon's, uh, Simon's wager is that we are here, right? Most of biological systems in nature will be nearly decomposable systems. So these are systems that um, exhibit some interaction between parts, in, s in some cases very important interaction between their parts, but they're not, they're, not, uh, they're not utterly dependent on every other part. So um, this is interestingly a critique of uh, modularism and mechanism. So modules, remember, are individuated functionally, so you have a visual module, for instance, and that, that, that module is supposed to be uh, responsible for the, directly responsible for the phenomenon. So you would have this visual module and it deals with uh, wh whatever representations it deal with, deals with and it just outputs visual perception. And they would be encapsulated in, and uh, simple localization here means one brain area, one function, and they're coupled in that way. Whereas what the mechanistic approach allows you uh, to do is to approach uh, modules uh, in a very different light. So uh, to say, well, there are different parts in the brain and these parts uh, are doing different things, but they're not necessarily coupled one-to-one. -one. Uh, these parts are not necessarily encapsulated and unable to interact with each other. They're actually constantly in dynamic interaction. Um, another interesting uh, 
I guess, result of uh, dynamic uh, mechanistic analysis is that the phenomenon of interest, for instance, visual perception, no longer has to be explained by the activity of one module, but can be explained by the activity of many mechanisms working in concert to produce a complex phenomenon, which is this complex localization, this idea that many operations can be performed by the same part, and many parts can, can help and uh, can uh, collectively realize a given operation. So that, 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 this allows us to uh, respond to the objection of uh, continuous reciprocal causation by, by saying, well, it's not true that just because uh, the, the different parts of the brain interact uh, in, in a very dynamic and constant way, um, that we wouldn't be able to identify certain sub-assemblies in the brain that would be responsible for representation. Um, so that's how uh, I think we can counter the two main objections to representationalism per se. I wanted to end on uh, some anti-representationalist -anti ideas. It might be more interesting to discuss these after uh, in the discussion, so I'll just gesture at them right now. Um, the first point concerns uh, computation. Right, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of the opponents of representationalist talk in cognitive science will say, okay, well, the computer metaphor is a bad metaphor, the brain is not a computer, the brain is a dynamical system, so let's just ditch the whole computation thing altogether and we're working with dynamical systems and that'll be that. Um, the thing is that uh, the kind of computation that computers do is just one specific form of computation. It's digital computation. So computation defined over discrete symbols that can be unambiguously distinguished one from the other. So like a zero or a one or like the, the, the idea behind all these different forms of computation is it's just that the system is able to distinguish different values in an unambiguous way. So, Classical computation, what Fodor and company are doing, is just one subtype of digital computation, and that doesn't even exhaust all the different kinds of computation, right? So Piccinini and Bahar, since 2009 or so, have been uh, working with also uh, Scarantino on these issues. Uh, what they're arguing is that actually there's a very real sense in which what neurons are doing is, uh, is information processing. It's not digital information processing as in a computer. It's not even analog. For a while there, in the 50s and 60s, they were experimenting with analog computers, so computers that deal with continuous singles ra signals rather than discrete um, entities. So their idea here is that uh, actually, in an important sense, computation is relevant to uh, cognitive science. So just the idea that the idea that the, the digital computer is a bad metaphor for the mind, on the one hand, doesn't undermine representationalism, and on the other hand, doesn't even undermine the idea that computation, in some sense, might be uh, useful uh, to understand intelligent behavior. And the last point that I want to make, and I'm really just going to gesture towards this, is that there are some very interesting frameworks today that are being developed, uh, most notably by people like Carl Friston. Um, these are predictive coding frameworks. So, Without getting into too many details, the idea is that uh, we're going to completely flip traditional cognitive architectures on, on their head, right? So traditionally, suppose you have like, a, like a, a brain here. Well, traditionally, what we're assuming the brain is doing is, is a kind of bottom-up feature detection, right? So like you have basic visual areas that are picking up lines and, and shadings and so forth. And then they're, they're treated by higher and higher cortical areas by kind of being agglomerated together by it. And this kind of additive model has been uh, criticized. And what these guys are saying is um, that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. it. It's exactly the inverse. What the brain is actually doing is, is heavy top-down predicting of what's going on, right? So the brain is actively engaged in creating a kind of fantasy. So it's almost a, a return to like a Freudian framework where what we're in contact with is like a psychic reality that's determined by our representations. So these people, while acknowledging uh, the, the very significant contribution that embodied, extended, and inactive... Uh, yeah, no, no, sorry. Okay, later. So these people acknowledge the contribution of uh, the embodied and extended and inactive views and so forth, but are saying that there, there's still a very important sense in which uh, there are representations in the brain and these representations are useful not only to encode memory and so forth, but actually to guide behavior. And if you guys are interested, I might be able to say a few words about that uh, in the discussion, but I think I've already taken uh, too much of your time. So. 
that, that was uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.